In today's webcast, we're going to talk about how to become a thought leader in your industry. Let's go. Hey everybody, this is Antoine Dupont with Catapult Marketing and this is webcast number 36 and we have Elizabeth Marshall in the house today. Hi Elizabeth, how are you? Hey, how are you guys? Uh, so th thank you so much for uh, for coming on the show. This is going to be a great show. We're going to be talking about how to become a thought leader in your industry and there is nobody better in my opinion, my humble opinion, in the United States uh, to talk about uh, becoming a thought leader. And a couple of things you need to know about Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the person, the go-to person for several thought leaders that you and I know. I, I'm gonna drop a couple of names there. Uh, Seth Godin uh, came to you, Michael Port, and Howard Behar. Did I say his name uh, properly? Uh -huh, Behar, yeah, former president of Starbucks. Mm -hmm. So so these guys are going to Elizabeth. So we really, uh, really uh, so thankful that uh, you're here with us. Um, but I'm going to give you a, a, a couple of minutes to introduce yourself. So tell us uh, what do you do, where do you live, and why do you get up in the morning? Okay, great. Yes. So so I get up in the morning to help thought leaders become the go-to leaders in their industry. You know, my clients, they have something really powerful to say. They want to shift the conversation in their industry. It's not just, hey, I want to write a book because it looks nice on the resume. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm so inspired to see when I get to work with amazing people across industries who want to shift the trajectory and become that go-to leader, that gets me fired up and, and gets me excited to wake up in the morning. Um, well, that and my, my two-year-old. Um, yeah, my, for sure. Yeah, so that's, that's an early wake-up call. And yeah, I live in Dallas and it's like a beautiful sunny day here. Wow, very cool. D Dallas, Texas. Yeah, I haven't been here. I haven't been there in a while. Um, but it's a beautiful, it's a b massive city. And uh, really strong business community. You know, we've got Toyota moving here. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of corporate headquarters relocating to the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. All right, very cool. So thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. Um, so how to become a thought leader in your industry? I asked Elizabeth to come to this webcast with three specific points uh, for you to think about in terms of the things that you would have to do to position yourself. You know, obviously there's nothing, uh, I mean, I've known Elizabeth and I've heard her speak, so I know there's nothing that is going to be overnight. This is not a quick, uh, a quick scheme or how to do it or how to buck the system. This is, you know, the types of hard work you're going to have to put in. But in terms of thinking, um, the first thing that you want to do, you told me is like develop your message or having a message, a message worth sharing. So what do you mean by that? So um, in many cases, Antoine, I'm often in interfacing with thought leaders for the first time. Um, around their book. Perhaps they're thinking about writing a book, they've just written a book and need help launching it, or they're in between their first and second book. And, and oftentimes I see um, with books, um, whether it's a book that's in process or already written, that it's probably not the best version that it could be. And that's because having something really valuable to say and having a well-developed message takes time. Mm -hmm. and as thought leaders, we feel pressure to do all this marketing activity, do more, 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 and oh, we've got to get a book published yesterday to right. get more speaking engagements, media, you know, fill in the blank. And while, yes, we want to have those tangible opportunities to connect with more of your audience, there's a right time for a book and a right strategy, a whole other conversation for another time. But the, right. the bottom line for today is that just like working out and exercising, you know, you want to develop and cultivate your message over time that it's, you know, it's not going to arrive in this like pretty box, you know, that you unwrap and there's the message, you know, you develop right. a message by, you know, every time you go out and speak, you think about, oh, I positioned that, you know, point in a particular way, or right. as you're looking out in the industry and seeing the conversation that's already happening on your topic, Mm -hmm. asking yourself what can you add 
change or do differently so that you actually stand out instead of just add to the noise. Right. There, you know, thousands and thousands of books published on every topic and mm -hmm. there's still space to contribute, but you need to know what's been said already, what's missing or how you would compile it differently mm -hmm. uh, in order to, to make that impact. And, and you can use that thinking and framework, whether you're developing a new speech, um, mm -hmm blog post or content series and, and certainly your book, but you want to keep it right. fresh and constantly evolve and grow your message. That's, that's really, really cool. And uh, you, we, we both um, have a person in common that we both know. I mean, you know him for many years, but Michael Port. And I remember uh, talking to uh, Michael Port about uh, Simon Sinek and about the why. And, and there was a portion of my speech that um, that I was working on that was addressing the why. And I was telling him, I felt, um, I felt weird that I was using the why because I felt that this was Simon Sinek uh, stuff and I just didn't want to be like, oh, he's trying to imitate Simon Sinek or he's trying to you know, leverage that. I mean, it was genuine something I want to talk about. And Michael looked at me and he says, Simon Sinek didn't invent the why. I mean, we talked about the why. He says, I talked about the why like 20 years ago. Like this why has been talked about for a lot of, for, 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 yeah. for maybe for a hundred years. And what Simon did is he packaged it in his own way with his own message and uh, he made it his own. And, uh, you know, the way he packaged it, it, it was absolutely brilliant. It resonated with a lot of people. And this is how it got. So it doesn't have to be unique. That was really interesting for me. It doesn't have to be That's right. brand new and unique, like nobody has thought about it. But it's your own experience. And it's your own way to articulate something that makes it unique. Because nobody has been in my shoes, nobody has been in your shoes, Elizabeth. And then we bring something unique to the conversation and our own unique perspective. Um, so I, I wanted to share that because I thought it was- uh, no, that's, uh, yeah. It's great, Antoine, because it actually touches on three criteria that we think about in the publishing industry. Mm -hmm. um, why now, why you, why this book? But you can substitute book for speech or, you know. Oh, well, whatever. say that again, why now? So, so why now? So the why now speaks to what's happening in today's market or in your industry or, you know, in the wider world that mm -hmm. makes your message particularly relevant in a way that, you know, when it comes to publishing, the way that you share your message, like you, you couldn't have shared this five years ago in the same way. There's something really significant happening right now. So for example, you know, the theme of, minimalism or decluttering or simplifying that's a really really hot topic because of how complex our lives are mm -hmm. um, so you want to tap into why now and the second one is why you and you touched on this the why you is everything from you know your resume and credentials and right you know particular like expertise and experiences but it's also about your family, your unique come from and approach and mm -hmm. that between that why now and the why you that allows you to make that unique contribution, even though, you know, the age old, you know, spiritual adage, there's nothing new other, under the sun. The right. Nothing's different. new. Uh, no, no, nothing's invented. Everything's transformed. Yes. And so when we think about the why now, why you, and then why this book out of all the knowledge and expertise you have, we could probably all write 20 books, but why this particular book right now? Mm -hmm. And that ties in with your business model, how you're serving clients, your stage as a thought leader. Um, I love sharing this story, speaking of our friend, Michael. Mm -hmm. Michael's first book was Book Yourself Solid. That was not the first book that he wanted to write. He wanted to write the Think Big Manifesto first. But that book was, the timing wasn't right for that book because he needed to continue to grow and build his audience. So he had a very specific audience of entrepreneurs and service professionals that were the audience for Book Yourself Solid, grew his platform that became a huge success and set the stage for them, him to write the book about thinking bigger about who you are and what you are for the world mm. as a result of that audience and, and platform. Whereas if he had done it the other way around, um, that book wouldn't have been a New York Times bestseller. 
Wow, this is very interesting. So um, it's a very interesting perspective. Now, one of the things you know, on this topic that I want to touch on, which I think is really important because in today's world, I think people are uh, vastly impatient uh, and they don't, they completely underestimate how long it takes. So, you know, let's just be, you know, in some of the, you, you've worked with a wide array, you've wor worked for some very famous and big people, but you've worked with a lot of people. What would you say is, you know, give yourself at least, you know, six months, one year, two years to to work yourself through it and then just really finding out what your message is? What, what would you say is at least the amount of time you should give yourself? Yeah, so, um, so I'm going to use the answer, it varies because it depends right. on a lot of things. Your stage as a thought leader, um, the structure of your business, how well developed you have your audience. Mm -hmm. But I will say that, you know, while it may take you, you know, 12 to 18 months to come up with a really good concept for a book, for example, that doesn't mean you're putting off making an impact. You right. can go out tomorrow, share a blog post, be a guest on a podcast, like what's happening here, mm -hmm. or go out and give a speech, build your audience, test certain aspects of your ideas and still be making progress. So a woman I um, worked with last fall who went through my thought leader platform diagnostic mm -hmm. um, has this amazing idea um, for a new book, um, but that idea is still in development. So she's mm -hmm. going out there um, sharing different stories and examples and speeches, mm -hmm. writing content, um, looking for opportunities to share small aspects of it through interviews, and that's helping her with the writing process. So oftentimes we get stuck because we're creating an isolation and we don't have that feedback and input from our audience that's needed. Not that we're asking them, oh, hey, tell me what to write next, but when we're sharing right. ideas, that gives us additional um, inspiration and input that we need to shape it in a way that's relevant. Because if we right. write the book over here and then mm -hmm. our audience is over here, well then who have we written it for? Yeah, exactly. And you know, I have something that I've said to entrepreneurs uh, is that overnight success takes about 10 to 15 years. You don't give right. or take a, a year or two. Um, you know, for me, it's like what I'm up to right now, I've given myself two years um, because I know that, you know, it just takes, um, it just takes time. It just, you know, you have to be, you know, you have to establish yourself and I'm not, you know, I'm not established like Michael Port or, or some of the people and I'm just really uh, brand new in the, uh, in the space and uh, I'm really you know, I'm, I'm really present that it's just going to take, you know, it's going to take some time. It's going to take, you know, maybe 25 to 50 stages before, you know, you start to have that little spark that says that people are like, oh yeah, I know this guy. Just, it takes a long time. Uh, and and, and that, that comes back to the why that you mentioned, you know, when you, as a thought leader, when you know that you want to change the conversation in the industry, mm -hmm. that gives you the fuel and the direction and the clarity that you need on a day-to-day -day basis to get up and say, okay, well, I'm not where I want to be yet, but I know I'm making an impact. Like you're make that you're making the most of each and every, every opportunity mm -hmm. uh, that you understand your stage as a thought leader and that you have an integrated strategy across all 10 elements so that you're not just busy with marketing activity, but you're focused on the right priorities for where you are right now so that, the, you know, you're investing your time and money and energy wisely so mm -hmm. that you get to that next stage instead of just like being on the Jetsons, um, right. <laughs> tread spinning your wheels. Right, right, right. Millennials watching may not know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, millennials, look it up. Go to Google, like type the Jetson. All right, cool. So this was point number one. Um, I'd love to hear your comments, guys, or questions for uh, Elizabeth. Um, you know, I, you've heard a couple of things, especially like, what have you done to develop your message? You know, what has been your methodology? Like what types of, 
of places and how long did it take you? I think that would be really interesting because I think, you know, for me, my experience is that people underestimate the, the amount of time and energy it takes uh, to become a, uh, to develop your message. So I, I'd love to hear from you guys, you know, how long did they take you? I'd like to hear some of those stuff like, okay, it took me 10 years to establish myself just to have, for the millenniums there, to have a sense of being grounded. All right, so that was point number one, develop your message. Point number two is uh, integrated strategy, the 10 elements of your platform. Now, when you said 10 elements, like you started to scare me, I'm like, holy moly, there's 10 elements? So uh, talk to me about this, um, yeah, about all these elements. That's part of the deal, right? Like, so there are 10 elements, but the reason it can feel overwhelming is because we're trying to do everything at once, or mm -hmm. we have gaps in our platform, mm -hmm. which then mean that, as I mentioned, kind of alluded to a moment ago, that we're busy with activity, but we don't actually understand where we're starting. So there are four stages of thought leadership and at any stage we need to know what's your starting point. So are you starting in Chicago, Dallas, doesn't Florida, where you are, doesn't right. matter where you're starting from, but we need to know where you're starting and then where are you heading? So if you're starting in Chicago, are you heading to New York or to San Diego? And that's dependent on your message audience and business model. So if we know where you're starting and we know what's right for you, not the strategy that worked for Michael or Seth or Simon Sinek, mm -hmm. there may be some best practices there, but we need to know what's your unique path. Mm -hmm. Then we can say, okay, based on your starting point, here's your priority areas. And there's, you need to, you know, pay attention to all 10 elements, but not all at the same time with equal intensity. So, mm -hmm. Um, I know Antoine, you mentioned we can put this link in the in the notes so people can remind themselves of the ten elements. But I'll go through them really quickly. All right, so we'll we'll put the link. So if you're on the podcast or on Facebook and whatnot, there is a, there is going to be a link in the comment or in the description that you can click on, and you'll have this document that Elizabeth is talking about. So if you're driving, don't you know don't don't start yes. clicking on that. Keep your eyes on the road, and you'll get it later. Okay. Great. So so message audience, website, content strategy, social media, publishing strategy, mm -hmm. speaking, strategic relationships, and business model. Oh, and traditional media. I forgot that. Tra so traditional media, yeah. Element. So yeah, but those are your 10, 10 elements. And so based on your stage, um, it may be the right time to focus on publishing. And then because you have a book coming out, you need to call someone like Antoine because your website's not quite where it needs to be to position you in a much broader public way. Or um, one of the key elements um, that tends to be a priority across all stages is strategic relationships. Um, but then you're developing them in different ways, you know, based on your stage. So it's both knowing the priority areas, what to focus on, as well as what not to focus on. So unfortunately, <laughs> I wish I didn't have this story, but you know, over and over again, I have potential clients come to me that say, oh, I just invested you know, several hundred dollars in this, several thousand dollars in this, or the record is like, $105,000 on this big, like snazzy, like promotion in a box campaign. Oh, and man. so understanding where you don't want to focus, like things like PR only work when you're positioned to take advantage of them. Or, you know, there's, there's always the latest and greatest new tools that are coming out, whether it be to help you launch your book or just to grow your platform. Mm -hmm. Some of them are cool and work. Some of them are cool and don't. And so, you know, really making sure that you have those foundational elements and you're not investing in shiny objects, but you're instead investing in the right places um, to actually move that needle. Right, now that's, that's really, uh, and, and it, it, you know, when you say a list like that, it, it, it can really occur overwhelming. Um, oh my God, like I, I, uh, I, I have to do all this. Um, and again, you know, I mean, for us, we deal with, with clients where we're managing their social media, their website, video marketing and SEO. Um, and, you know, and, and sometimes they need everything. 
uh, they need everything, but that doesn't mean we're going to do everything at once because yeah. uh, it's just too much. Um, for so sometime financially, they can't afford it. Um, but it's also, it's, it's, it's too much. It requires too much bandwidth for, for someone to, to tackle at once. And the way you eat an elephant is, you know, one bite at a time. So you basically, right. you know, tackle, um, you know, out of the 10, you know, you can look at, you know, what could I have, you know, uh, completed? Maybe, maybe it's your website you want to do first. Maybe you want to develop your keynote for your public speaking. Um, you know, I mean, it, you obviously will have something in all the pans, right? You have, so you have a stove and you have 10 pans going on at the same time. You know, maybe it's time to take a couple of pens off the stove. Yeah, and you're some saying, burners are turned off for a while. Yeah, turn them off because it's like, listen, uh, you know, I, I don't know about what you guys have in Texas, but here in Florida, we only have 24 hours in a day. Um, uh, and it's just that that's it, you know, and out of those 24, if you're, you know, you're going to sleep seven or eight out of them and you know, <laughs> going to be with the, with your kids, right? Uh, I, I have a... I have three uh, three teenagers that require some of my time, and 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 a wife that likes to have some of my time. So it's just like, you know, if you you, you only have you know, I want to say 10, 12 hours a day, but you can be, uh, you know, functional and just you can't tackle everything at that's, once. That's right, and I would say even beyond that, for the thought leader, you know, beyond the fact that we're finite, yes, beings, we have twenty four hours in a day. It's also we don't, we only need to be focusing on three to four key areas based on our stage. So we might mm -hmm. have, we will have maintenance activities in areas like content strategy and social media. Um, and so depending on your stage, you could like, that could be a key priority area, mm -hmm. um, but you can have that main maintenance and then know, okay, you know what? My message and audience, are not as clear as I thought they could be. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, this is con these are conversations I have with well-established authors and speakers that have mm -hmm. published one, two, three books that are, you know, charging fifteen thousand dollars a keynote. Even thought leaders at that stage will get to a certain point and say, you know what? Based on my development and how my my business has evolved, I do need to redirect and focus my message and audience. It's feeling stale or I'm straddling too many categories and I need to narrow down even more or you know with strategic relationships I've kind of neglected those and I've spent all this money and time on you right. know other marketing which is good but I'm missing the the, the the lowest hanging fruit that leads you to some amazing opportunities and I'm kind of uh, tipping the hat to our next strategy because I get right. so no, 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 but I, I think it's, it's, it, I'm glad we have this at the third point because um, it's, uh, it's important. So um, we're, we're going to jump into number three, but before we do, again, um, I'd like to hear uh, based on the, the, the 10 point, the 10 elements of, uh, of your platform uh, that you have to work on. I'd love to hear from, from you guys, you know, what your thoughts are, you know, which one, um, did you struggle with or which one like you had a, a huge win and, you know, share with, uh, with everybody, um, you know, how you got success and how you got through, uh, you know, developing something like, you know, obviously, you know, for me, you know, working on my, uh, on my keynote and public speaking, uh, I invested, uh, with heroic public speaking with Michael Port. So that's, you know, that's one area that I, I actually have, you know, nurtured that and developing this and whatnot. Um, and there is, you know, all these things, but I'm not, I'm not doing all 10, uh, right now. I mean, I know that, you know, for a fact, I mean, I've, I've I have the idea of a book and, um, and it's like, for me, it's not, um, it's not in the reality for, at least the first six months of 2018. It's just and not in the cards. And that's great that you know that, that you, you know, speaking is a priority right now. And the steps that you can take around speaking help you prepare the pathway to that right book. Right. And, so and, what, and what's also important, what I discovered with, uh, with Michael Port is that, um, 
I am not, so I'm not skilled. I do not have enough skill. And as you can tell from my accent, I'm not native English. So I'm not skilled enough to, uh, to be writing it. It's not a strength of mine. But speaking is, writing is not. And what I uncovered is that the vast majority of people uh, out there that have books didn't do it alone. Um, That's right. They have a team of writers of people that it's not there is ghost writing. There's definitely people that have books written for them. Uh, but the vast majority of people actually um, use a writer and, you know, use the brainstorm sessions to uh, to to uh, to talk with this writer to actually generate a book. And this is what's going to happen for me. And I'm also um, I, I also know the cost of it. Uh, it's not cheap if you want to do oh, it right. Is there's this myth that you can um, right. publish a book. You, you can technically publish a book this afternoon on Amazon, right. but the best, the most successful books right. have incredible covers, which a really good cover, 1500 and up, if not more like 2,500. So how much is a book? Like let's, 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 let's talk us at dollars and cents here. What would you say someone should have in, in their budget and their back pocket if they want to have, you know, work with a team to help them write a book and they know they can't do it on their own. They're going to need some assistance. What type of budget would you say they need to have? Yeah. So, um, so just to, to distinguish, you know, if you have a, if you have a big enough audience and can put together a book proposal and you get chosen by a traditional publisher, you don't have to pay for a lot of those costs. They have editorial support, you know, their right. design cover, so forth. But if you're self-publishing, mm -hmm. there's everything from all the editorial services you might need from mm -hmm. a developmental editor that can help you structure the book to mm -hmm. um, more of a line editor to say you, you're a decent writer, you still need an editor to help you shape the book. Mm -hmm. So editorial services, proofreading, cover design, interior design so all the design elements to the book in terms of like what the page looks like right. there's things like indexing and you know printing and all of that so to do a self-published book really excellently and really well it's several thousand dollars yeah i mean i i for me it's like i want to have a budget i, I want to do it well um and i i'm looking at you know i at least twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars set aside, so I, I I have I have enough budget that I can hire the, the 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 I mean, good writers are not cheap either. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like that's you know, right. I, right. I want so I I think that's the reality of it. It's like you know, and what I've studied and looked and talked to people and you know, how much does it cost? It's like yeah. I mean, you, of course you can do it. I. Of course, there are people. Cheaper, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course, there are people that have done it for you know maybe five to ten grand. They got a they got themselves a book. Um, but you know, and bear in I, bear in mind that I can't write uh, to save my life. Yes, um, we have a caller dialing in to ask us a question. <laughs> yes, we we have a caller. Yeah. So um, I will say, you know, I've had clients. Um, I used to run a workshop in New York for three year, for years called um, Book Breakthrough, and we would have clients you know, emerging authors come to that. And, you know, you can do what's called a star book as well, which is mm -hmm. you know, a smaller concept. A really great example of this is a book called Fierce Loyalty by Sarah mm -hmm. Robinson. Really mm -hmm. nice cover. Of course, she's a good writer, so she didn't have to get as much right. editorial support. She was able to do that very affordably. It's If you order it on Amazon, you'll see it's not a huge book. Right. Um, but it basically outlines her methodology and talks about the why now and some of the benefits of building a fiercely loyal community. Right. And strategically it helped her build relationships with industry groups and companies. Right. So there, there's a time and a place to do a starter book, but you know, if you, it is good to know, like when you, you're doing that bigger signature book, it, it does, right. It's yeah. not going to be two hundred dollars. Right, right. It, you know, I'm, and I was just thinking, man. I just set myself up. I mean, like any uh, writer that's listening to this podcast is going to send me a sales letter. Well, we'd love to have your twenty-five thousand dollar. So, um, uh, and if that's you know, if they contact me, uh, that's fine. But uh, yeah, I, I know that there is. Uh, you don't have to have a huge book. You know, you don't have to have the big old. Uh, you know. Uh, 
uh, you know, 400 pages book, you can start. Uh, actually, uh, I was just recommended a book on uh, on sales. Uh, I believe it's 94 pages. It's a very small book. It's kind of like a weekend read, uh, and I'm sure that that book didn't cost 25,000 to. Uh, of course, to right. And it's and it's still it's a very good quality uh, a good quality book that. Um, uh, that you get a lot of value, so I think that it runs the it runs the the, the gamut and whatnot. All right, it does, and the biggest differential is how much support you need around writing. Like if right. you, you know, Absolutely. yeah, having like having a ghostwriter. I mean, that's yes, between twenty five fifty upwards of seventy five thousand dollars. So the more you can, and that's why it's important. Coming back to point one, if you're developing your message through you know, even videos, blog posts, interviews, and speaking, you get clear on what you're trying to say and how it should be structured, as well as you can look out on Amazon and say, okay, how, you know, what are the typical ways that books are structured? What are some potential models for how I think my message would be structured? Then you have a starting point. You can flesh it out with an outline. You can do the best you can with writing. And then you say, okay, now I do need to bring in you know, a developmental editor with concept, or I just need mm -hmm. someone to help me line by line. Okay, cool. Now, I'd like to have some comments from you guys out there. Uh, put in the comments, if you had a, uh, a book written, what was your process? If you can share how much it, you know, how much you've invested into it, that would be awesome. So for everybody to, uh, to actually uh, learn from that. Um, but I want to move into the uh, third point. So the first one was develop your message. The second one was have an integrated strategy to 10 elements of your platform. And then the third one, which we touched on, is strategic relationships. So let, talk to me about that. What do you mean by strategic relationships? Yeah, so um, strategic relationships are those relationships with key individuals and groups in your industry that connect that are you know related to your audience so mm -hmm. this is um the podcaster that you really want to you know invite you to be a guest or the um author that you'd really love to help promote your book it's the industry association where you want to speak locally or regionally or um, the organization that looks to partner with thought leaders like you mm -hmm. in a variety of forms and what i found antoine and working with many, many New York Times bestsellers as well as emerging authors, mm -hmm. this strategy is your fast track. It's your workaround. Yes. Starting today, I don't, it doesn't matter what your platform looks like, how much money you do or don't have, you can begin building these relationships and these relationships open the door to the tangible opportunities you want, to the speaking, to the clients, to you know guest articles, to all of that. And... Um, yes, so we, this is, you know, as you know, I'm passionate about this and you heard, you know, through heroic public speaking, this is my keynote and it's, it's also my story too. So you might say, well, how in the world did she get to work with somebody like Seth Godin? Well, I got a chance to meet Seth when I had hardly any audience at all, the wrong website and none of the usual credentials that happened because of my relationship with Michael. And when I saw Michael hosting a teleseminar, yes, teleseminar, because it was back in 2007 when they were cool. Um, <laughs> when Michael was hosting a teleseminar to help Seth launch his book, The Dip, I was like, Michael, I have an idea. Nobody ever gets to hear Seth. I wanna be, like facilitate a conversation with Seth and a couple of other leading experts in the field would you make an introduction? He liked my idea. And by the way, we had a really strong relationship that I had developed over time. So I wasn't asking before. There was no request without rapport. So rapport right. Was request. Right. Um, and long story short, I was able to host a virtual book tour for Seth for his book, The Dip, then went on to host another one for Meatball Sunday and then his book, his um, tribes after that. Um, and so strategic relationships, not all of them are going to lead to things like that, but they are that way that you get more of what you need to grow your platform. Mm, yeah. I'm going to channel uh, Matthew Kimberly here uh, for that because um, this is the thing that I've uh, done reading. Um, you can look him up, Matthew Kimberly. 
I don't remember what the name yeah, is. Dot has. Com, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. MatthewKimberly.com. There you go. Um, and he has a PDF there, and he was talking about the list of 100. And I actually did that, made a list of 100 people that you want to have a relationship um, uh, with, that you need to, you want or you need to de develop a relationship with. Um, and so, you know, obviously I, I've made that list and then, then the approach after that for me, um, is that you don't give without asking. That's right. Um, and it's like, you know, it's completely like give, give, give. And I don't know what I'm going to ask if I, I, and I, I may never ask anything, but I'm giving in that relationship because one day I may need, I may need to ask for something could you introduce me to that person? Or I know you know that person, could you make an intro? And all of a sudden that's all you need, but you can't do that if you haven't developed that relationship. And the way you develop a relationship is by, uh, by giving unconditionally without asking, not with anything in return. It's not like, oh, I'm gonna do this for you, can you please do that for me? This is not how it works. Yeah, right. It's not quid to use our you know, lawyer speak, it's not quid pro, pro quo. Right, right, exactly. And yeah, and you know, for those listening, you might think, okay, I know the re importance of relationships. That's why I'm building my newsletter list and social media. Well, these are, you know, individual relationships and there's four principles to help you do that. So number one, know who you're trying to reach. This comes mm -hmm. back to the clarity around your message and audience. Mm -hmm. So that you're not just trying to mass amass all these relationships, like collecting them like pens or, <laughs> you know, old, <laughs> you know, old uh, iPhones. Right. Um, but you're clear on, you know, who's relevant in your world. Right. Secondly, you're focusing on relationships, not outcomes. Building on what you said, it is about giving and being of service. Right. Third, you know, understanding to how to master the art of the ask. So three, master the art of the ask. So when it is time and there is rapport there, um, but you're not asking for things that are really difficult or challenging. But right. You're really easy for people to say yes and then finally it's making the most of each opportunity so I have a client who started a relationship with an organization with a webinar for like 40 people and you might say well that sounds really lame but that one webinar has now led to her reaching thousands and thousands of people around the globe because she's given isn't, multiple isn't that amazing right yeah it's and so you make the most of each and every step because that's what this, what this world is. Becoming a go-to leader in your industry is a journey. It's not this, you know, um, sure thing or this, you know, um, blueprint in a box type of type mm -hmm. of. A yeah, I, I just finished. I just did a, a webinar just recently. Uh, this was my second one with this organization. And I'm going to do another one in April, um, and I'm get, getting hardly nothing for it. Um, it it's really, um, it, it's really most of my time. Uh, but it's again, it's an opportunity for me to uh, to speak, and uh, I'm going to be speaking in front of people. Um, and I'm like, I know who's in the audience. I don't know. I, I mean, yes. I I don't know. You know, six degrees of separations. Um, and I'm, I'm just willing to give and I'm not asking for anything in return. I'm just going to uh, give some of my time. So it's an investment in that relationship. Um, and I have no idea. I don't have any a specific outcome that, I, uh, that I'm expecting out of it. All I'm knowing is I'm nurturing that relationship and I'm, and I'm giving into that relationship because obviously strategically it's a good, it's within my, it's within my realm. And sometimes yeah. I have people that approach me and I'm like, you know, we're not in the same industry. You're, you are we're, we're way too far apart. And it's just no point in me in trying to nurture that relationship, unless I have an enormous affinity with that person. And I really like them as a person. Then you know, obviously that's a different thing, but you know, we're in a, in a business sense, um, you know, you, you got to look at, um, you know, people within your industry uh, that are, um, that you could give and, 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 and just contribute and then just being, be willing to share. That's right. And to be open to how they want to, to, for people, for thought leaders to give to them. So 
especially as it relates to speaking, we might look at, you know, various conferences or industry associations and say, oh, I've got to be on that keynote stage when in fact, they may not, A, you may not be at that stage, you may not like be qualified to be the main stage keynote. But mm -hmm. beyond that, even if you are, mm -hmm. um, looking for the way to start the relationship first to say, okay, well, maybe their conference just ended, but I could do a guest post or be interviewed for their mm -hmm. podcast. I have another client who, you know, developed a relationship with an industry group and, and her first dance with them was being um, a, submitting a guest blog. And two years later, she was the closing keynote for their annual conference. I guarantee you that would not have happened had she not been willing to build that um, build that relationship. Um, another client just last week gave a keynote for 2,500 people. That came without, you know, the most recent, like his most recent speaker video or some of the credentials that you would say would be required to get that level of keynote. Mm -hmm. All came through strategic relationships and listening uh, in terms of how you can be of service and what's the right next step versus right. what your agenda is. Right. And you can actually sniff out. And I have this happen to me, like people that actually want to, you know, connect with me for, because they just want to have access to the people I know, however small it is, you can sniff it out. And um, so you, you just want to absolutely be a, uh, uh, authentic you want to be real and you really actually want to contribute Do, don't you can't fake this because if you fake it people are going to know you're uh, you're full of it and uh, and this is not what, what we're saying it's not yeah it's not fake like it. fake it's like we really know like we really know <laughs> right right like listen you know and just like yeah contribute and by the way there's tons of stuff you can do for people and I have some people on my list that I actually I mentioned his name I say Simon Sinek Simon Sinek is on my list um, and and I have and I don't know. And it's not, it's not like I'm pursuing every day. Oh, I got to get in contact. I know that at one point or another, I'm going to come across, uh, I'm going to come across him. And I, at that point, I'll decide whatever I can do. Uh, and I may just say, you know, if there's anything I can do for you, whatever it is, or, or just, you know, just, I, it, it's just there as a person that I would like to be connected because I'd love to actually, um, uh, have a conversation with uh, with him and you know whatever he's up to I think is uh, very intriguing and is a uh, you know inspiring and, and speaker of today so this, this is just like that you just don't necessarily know how you're going to connect with the people but just right. have them on your list this and is it's the this or something greater you know to say okay I would love to connect with Simon Simon and others like him so that right, right. right we're open to right all right. the great and then the mistake that I see people do also sometimes is like, and I'm going to say, I mean, for me, as I'm, I'm very pragmatic, so it's just, I'll, I'll, I'll meet with Obama or Oprah and whatnot. And I'm like, listen, you know, it's just, there's the gap is so big. And I just, that doesn't mean that you're, it's never going to happen for you. But there is like, you, you also have to be grounded in the reality as to where you are. Um, and, and, and then it's just two different stratosphere. Well, uh, and, and and often the reason that we want to meet celebrities like, like, oh, if we could just get over right. to promote our book, we would be like this bestseller from now until eternity. Right. The reason we want to connect with people is because of what we think it will do for our book and our platform. Right, right. And that not only does the introduction on, almost ever happen, but that result doesn't happen. It doesn't. Right? You know, when you look out in the industry at all the thought leaders that you admire, they have built their platform one opportunity at a time, and there's literally right. a magic bullet. I mean, yeah. even colleagues of mine who were on Oprah back in the day, it, you know, for all the authors that have been on there, very few become like Brene Brown, who are BFFs, you know, with, with but the, isn't uh, Brene Brown was uh, did she did she become famous with her TEDx and then became friend with she, Oprah? Yeah, she she really got some incredible momentum for from her original TEDx and then a second. But then when Oprah discovered her, then that was like catapult. Right. Here, yeah, that catapulted her. Yeah. So it's so what what I say to those things is these are possible. Um, but I would have people that are actually accessible. For me, Simon Sinek is 
is accessible and is possible because even though he's a big name and is a big uh, public speaker right now, um, he very likely would be attending a conference uh, that would be attending. Right, uh, right. So that's, that's that, one of right, so there's a connection. Right, I don't. I don't go to conferences where Oprah is, or I, it's. I'm not. She's not even my target audience or anything like that. So that's why I would say it would be uh, uh, absolutely and utterly ridiculous for me to to have her. Um, all right, cool. So this was strategic relationship. This was awesome, and you this can was. You start where you are now, like today. Start with that local or regional group. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, and you can send cards. You know, that's one of the things I'm actually doing. Mm -hmm. um, I just pulled out this, like you know, little well, handwritten cards. Yes. You know, handwritten I cards. I received a lovely one from you a couple of weeks so ago. So I'm going to talk to the millennium. It's the stuff where you, you know, you use a pen, and then you just write on it, and then you put it in the envelope, and you send it to someone. And okay. when they receive it, they're like, oh, "Wow!" <laughs> but it's it, it. Let me tell you, it's so. Um, it, uh, it's, it's such a simple thing to actually send a ha handwritten note to someone and just saying, you know what, I really, uh, like, think about an author um, uh, that you actually admire. You can find their address and send them a, send them a handwritten Absolutely. card saying, I really got an enormous amount of value out of your book. Thank you so much for writing it best. You know, Antoine or Elizabeth and that person receives that letter. Do you know how many of those cards are they getting? Not a lot. Not that many, right? Not, Certainly not, a lot. not compared to yeah, like to emails. It, and this may actually, and again, you're not you're not wanting anything in return. You just sent the card, right? But it's like this card plus the next thing plus the next thing plus the next thing, and all of a sudden that person says, "I know that person." And that and that's that's this how you actually build a relationship. It's just being of contribution and just you know acknowledging uh, whatever they're whatever they're up to. So this was really cool. Thank you so much. So there was three Absolutely. things, and I'd love to hear your feedback and your comments on strategic relationship. How do you do it? How did you develop a strategic relationship with people? I'd love to hear what you uh, what you have done. All right. There was so there was three things. Develop your message. Message was sharing. It was number one, integrated strategy, 10 elements, 10 elements of your platforms, and we'll have the link in the description. And the number three was strategic relationship. And on that note, Elizabeth, thank you so much. This was really awesome. My you know, how, pleasure. How to, become, how to become a thought leader in your industry. And this was, you spent a lot of time with us, uh, giving us a lot, of, uh, a lot of pearls. So thank you so much for- well, I love time. giving in this way, so thank you, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so if you got value out of this webcast, please you know, click below and like it. This is how we know we're doing a good job. And if you're on uh, YouTube, please subscribe, do it now. Um, and on that note, uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, you have an amazing day and I can't wait to see you on stage sometime soon. Yeah, likewise. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.